Hare Krishna Guruku, welcome back to the Monks podcast. Hare Krishna. Glad to be back, Chaitanya Charanji. Always. Yeah. It's, I thought we could continue our churning of the Gita that we had started last time. So we have been doing that over many sessions. But there's one concept of the Gita which is very intriguing. At the same time, there's certain, it's mysterious. What exactly mm. is the, it's the one that is the concept of the gunas, the modes? So, I'll start with the little understanding of mine and we could explore the subject a little bit. So, Krishna talks about the modes in the 14th chapter ex- uh, exhaustively, but that's not the only place. He elaborates on it further again in the 17th chapter, 18th chapter. And the reference begins right from the second chapter itself. So, yeah. my understanding of the modes is twofold. One is Krishna talks about nibadnanti, they bind. So we could say they are almost like ropes and that is the standard image that we have. That they are like ropes that bind spirit to matter. So mm. they, they like if there's soul and there's matter, the modes shape the way we perceive matter and we process material phenomena, we respond to them. So they condition us to particular ways of uh, perceiving, processing, responding. That's one understanding. And then another is that modes are also constitutive of material nature. They are like the building blocks of material nature. So, this illusion energy, it is not just, she's not just acting through modes, he says he's made of the modes. So, it seems if you look at the description of Sankhya given in the Bhagavatam, there also the modes seem to be very much integral to the process of creation. So, are these two broad understandings, uh, uh, they are compatible with the, uh, the Gita? Or would you like to elaborate on them, clarify, correct, or whatever? No, no I, I, I like your understanding. Um, I would offer, though, a different translation of the word guna. Oh, yeah. Actually, I was thinking of that. Um, yes, please go ahead. Yes. Of course, the word modes, you know, are, are, is, 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 you can, it can be found uh, being applied here. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. I, I'm suggesting perhaps a little bit more of an extravagant translation that is, I think, descriptive, uh, which might be, uh, well, the word guna itself uh, has a very direct, a one of several direct meanings, which is, as you know, quality. Okay. And I would suggest that these qualities are arising from primordial nature. That, you know, we, we have a doctrine of parinamavad, so that Brahman, you know, that, that Prakriti is a transformation of Brahman. Yes. And so at, at the heart of Prakriti is spirit, is, is spiritual nature. But then there are levels of blocking that nature. Okay. Blockages, you know, um, shades of darkening, something that is purely light. That's beautiful. So the quality, you know, the qualities are, I mean, it, it's a brilliant um, model. The, these, these, uh, the trigunya, the three gunas. It's brilliant. Why is it brilliant? Because it can be used in, in a transposable fashion. You can bring it into matters of psychology matters of sociology, matters of interacting with the, 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 the world, um, uh, uh, you know, even uh, on technology, various levels. Um, technology, ecology. Ecology, exactly. It, it's transposable. It's a, yeah. it's a transposable system, mm. you see. And so... Consequently, as you well know, because you know my book very well the, in the Bhagavad Gita, I don't translate sattva, rajas, 
and tamas. I don't translate them. Mm. Why? Because they're so transposable, I can't commit them to any kind of meaning specifically. Mm. Now, of course, you could say that in one sense, let's go back to the idea of spirit. Well, the gunas sort of tell us how far away are we getting from the purity of spirit. Okay. So, I mean, just like the, the, um, uh, the Bhagavad Gita says in the 17th chapter, right? According to the degree of sattva, the faith of everyone becomes manifest, O Bharata. Mm. A person is made of this faith. Whatever the faith, that is indeed what one is. Mm. It's interesting, bro. I mean, there's so, a okay, you can complete this. Yeah. 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 Okay. The well, I, I, come on in. Yeah. 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 So you made a lot of beautiful points. <laughs> So first yeah. is that yeah, translatability, as I have uh, started reading English English more and more, this is, I was already reading of course, but when I started coming yeah. to the West and uh, uh, encountering people speaking English more and more, you could say as their first language, I started realizing that the, the word, all the four words, mores, goodness, passion and ignorance, they have certain connotations in people's minds which come into play whenever we use those words. And then yes. is, see, we are introducing a new concept and people already have conceptions about the word we are using for that. So it just becomes, right. in one sense, it, it's like compounding the confusion. So I have yes. increasingly started using the word Sattva Rajas and Tamas only. Let me just give an explanation initially. Right. And then start using those words. So I, I, I experimented yes. with different translations, but it, it just doesn't uh, work, especially the word passion nowadays has a very positive connotation. Yeah. You know, find your passion in life. Right. So that's right. Similarly, you could say goodness has, I don't know, no, sometimes it has a little holier than thou kind of attitude. It, it is, <laughs> isn't it? it, it is, yeah. uh, of course, there are many connotations, but yeah. <laughs> And even the yeah. word, now, of course, the point here is, uh, I don't think either of us have any intention of uh, of pointing any faults with Prabhupada's translation. The point is that we, the world has changed and people see things differently. And uh, yes. we have to see whether Prabhupada's intention is being fulfilled or not. Isn't it? Prabhupada ultimately wanted to teach yes. Bhagavad Gita. And yes, among devotees, we yes. very well. Uh, so, so maybe we have discussed a little bit about you earlier translating your own Bhagavad Gita and how there was some, some uh, you could say, some questions raised about it. Now, with respect yes. to, oh, and we have answered that elaborately also, so I don't think we need to go into that. But uh, maybe we could just talk briefly about uh, the need for maybe retranslating or non-translating certain terms. Like, I remember one of the things that you yes. do in your book, book also is that you don't translate avatar as incarnation. You, I think you use the word descent. That's right. there. Yeah. So divine descent, divine descent. Yeah. So incarnation, yes. if I remember right, what you say is that it has that karna flesh to come in flesh. So Jesus, right. Jesus is often called as incarnation. And according to Christian theology, Jesus came in a, you could say human material body. So their idea is yes. that, that God came as a human being, not that he came yes. as if like a human being. So the word incarnation has a particular connotation, which, which is categorically rejected by our philosophy. So in that sense, Correct. that problem becomes uh, that, uh, that creates a particular connotation. So Sadaput, yes. in one of his lectures, he also points out the problem. He says that it's like there's an unfamiliar term and an unfam unfamiliar con concept. So Prabhupada right. knew that the concept was unfamiliar. But in order to minimize the complexity, Prabhupada sometimes chose a familiar term, even if that familiar term didn't exactly describe that concept. Then Prabhupada would use the right. familiar term, 
and then he would qualify. And this is not like this. Krishna doesn't have a material world. Right. Prabhupada emphasized that. Right, right. Maybe you could elaborate yes. on this further, please. Yes. Oh, you, well, you're bringing out a very important point here, uh, Chaitanya Charanji, because when we use terms, whatever we choose to use, we still have to explain them. We have to annotate them, you know? Um, and in philosophy, that's one of the most important, you know, um, uh, sort of prerequisites to making an argument or, or putting forth a philosophical vision. You have to define terms carefully so we know what we're talking about. So, um, so I figured since we're having to define terms anyway, might as well leave it in the Sanskrit, you know, sattva, rajas, and tamas. Um, uh, the, 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 um, so whenever we look at these ideas, they're very much context driven according to the writer and author, translator, how he or she brings these things out of the text. So again, it's a carefully nuanced process, isn't it? So, so when I explain uh, Sattva Rajas and Tamas, I begin with the idea that Prakriti is tra a transformation of Brahman. And so, in effect, oh, sorry, we, you. you know, sorry uh, to interrupt you. So, I think, Inka, yeah, uh, you are going into the concept of the gunas. So, I, I, I'm, that's perfectly fine. But do you want to speak something more about translation itself, or what we discussed till now was fine enough? Like how words are you? Are you explaining that itself with a concept going into deeper? Oh yeah, yeah and uh, we'll go deeper with which which? Um, no, the two things we discussed about uh, one point I was mentioning that we, our oral topic is the modes, but while right, right. we're discussing about the the need or the acceptability of translating terms differently. So I think what you said was that oh, there's, I no, see. Need to, I there's see. no need to translate itself because anyway we are going to explain the terms. Right. So better keep them as it is. Right. Okay. Right. Right. So so in a way I'm combining both. Okay. Yeah. And then your point was context driven. <laughs> yeah, I'm combining both. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Very beautifully. So Prabhu in Prabhupada's context, Prabhupada is drawing out the essential meaning by the way he is engaging in his discourse. And now you are explaining how you engage in your discourse. In your context, how you are drawing out that. Term. Right. Okay, yeah, makes sense. Yes. Thank you. But but now that you mention it, now that you mention it, let's go back to Prabhupada's uh, context. Hmm. Here's, the, here's the problem that will, uh, that some outside readers, when being introduced to Prabhupada's uh, very consistent translations of goodness, passion, and ignorance, respectively, of sattva, rajas, and, and tamas, um, the problem can arise easily that goodness has one kind of axis, uh, an axis of uh, maybe ethics. Um, passion can have the axis of, uh, say, a behavioral uh, sort of psychology. Um, and ignorance can be uh, either epistemological or, um, <laughs> or whatever. So in other words, if if tamas is ignorance, then sattva would it, it would stand to reason that sattva would be knowledge, because sattva oh. and tamas are pretty much two ends of the spectrum. Beautiful. And rajas would be a mixture. Mm. So if 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 sattva is light, then tamas should be dark, and Rajas would be shaded. Um, if if Rajas is passion, then uh, perhaps Sattva would be dispassionate, and perhaps Tamas would be, you know, recklessness <laughs> or something like that. Okay. You see what I'm saying? There's there need see there's an axis. There's an axis. By axis, so are you for, referring to the the broad frame within which a particular term is understood? So goodness is associated with virtue. Yes. I said, you said ignorance is associated with epistemology. And what about passion? Is it with activity or what was the word used? Broadly? Yes. Activity. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So so we're not, well now you see now Prabhupada's 
in, in one sense, I mean, I, I see a certain level of genius in, in Prabhupada's translations here, because in a way, I think people can relate to when when there's when, when we're acting out of goodness, we are a much more thoughtful, we're more reflective, we're more sensitive to others. Uh, when we're passionate, we can be a bit reckless, uh, we can be insensitive, we can be, um, uh, how do you say, um, acting in, in an impetuous way. Mm. Um, and, and, and ignorance uh, is simply like, I'm oblivious. I'm just oblivious to to the other uh, person. I'm not. I'm just. There's no sensitivity there at all. Um, I'm uh, just, uh, you know, completely unknowledgeable about the situation. Unaware. Unaware. You know. So I can see an axis going through those. That is, on some sense, personally related, but in a strict kind of philosophical fashion, mm. I look for anything that can illustrate something of transparency, translucency, and opacity. Beautiful. Transparency, second was translucency. Yeah, semi-transparent. Yes. Okay, beautiful. Yeah, That's right. going back to your yes. earlier point about how you said that at the heart of Prakriti's consciousness is spirit, and there are different degrees of blockages. Yes. So tamas means yes. spirit is blockage. Mm, yeah. Opacity. Opacity, okay. Opacity, complete blockage. And mm. and uh, of course, it's never complete because we learn that the three gunas, the trigunya, uh, there's always a little bit of sattva and rajas in a dominant state, the dominant state of 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 uh, tamas uh, of darkness um, or opacity. So there's always a little glimmer of light somewhere. Wherever there, as much as uh, prakriti covers consciousness uh, and is a transformation of it, there's always a little bit, you know. There's no pure darkness, mm. but there is such a thing as pure sattva, pure mm, transparency. Yeah. So there's no vishuddha tamas. <laughs> there is vishuddha sattva. Okay, yes. But just going back to your you point. Uh, so beautiful, bro. This, yeah. this, I made out, this transparency, translucency, and opacity. So in one sense, we could say, yes. in Prabhupada is using goodness, passion, ignorance. He's talking about how conscious, at one level, is how that consciousness may manifest as virtue, how it may manifest as, as action, and how it may manifest yes. as cognition. And I'm not sure, yes. yeah, in one sense, whether we could correlate this with Satchitananda, but it it is this three axis is quite a bit of uh, it's a nice frame of looking at it. So sat is usually connected yes. to sattva, mm -hmm. and in this case yes. you could say chit. Ch there's no consciousness, so no 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 sorry no, no con chit means consciousness which relates to cognition awareness. So right. ignorance could say the absence of awareness. Ab that's ignorance, and then mm. yes in. In Rajas, we're constantly craving for pleasure, but it is a misdirected kind of pleasure. We seek pleasure in things that end up in distress for us. So that, yes. is, that could be called the mode of action is passion. Krishna also says, Rajasas to falam dukkham. That mode of action, that yes. action in passion leads to distress. Yeah, so, so it could be correlated. Do you think it's a reasonable correlation? No. Really? <laughs> no, I don't think it is. <laughs> no. Satchidananda. So these are the attributes of of being um, a a jiva, you know, a jiva, okay. and 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 each each of those attributes of Satchidananda will be dulled or lit up accordingly. Yeah, of course. So, in other true. words, that is true, of course. Okay. No, I, I mean, obviously, right. but it's I, not that it's not that only one attribute will be covered by one mode and another by another mode. No, I was just talking about these three right. could roughly correlate with the three attributes of the soul. Three attributes of the soul. Satchitananda could correlate with goodness, passion, and ignorance. Not that in Sat, in goodness, only the Sat aspect is evident, or in passion, the Chitas, Rajasa, the, not like that. 
I think it's a whole different dimension. We'll skip that. Right. If yeah. I mean, I'm not sure I understand what you're saying, but but I think that um, the so, the let me, uh, let me just rearticulate it. If yeah. You're okay. So yeah, Sat refers to the existence of the soul. The soul is godly. It's part of God. Mommy, mom, so Ji will okay. So when you talk about goodness. the the word goodness could broadly connote with the sat attribute of the soul hmm? could broad it's not that okay. in goodness the sat aspect is seen not like that it's, it could broadly connote then chit and ananda so chit is the capacity cognitive capacity of the soul is called consciousness awareness so that yes. chit the absence of chit could correlate with tamas ignorance ignorance is proper tense and ananda is the mm-hmm. pleasure seeking potency Uh, pleasure seeking nature and that is what defines uh, a person's rajas there are no other consideration primary is how can i enjoy how can i gain pleasure so in that sense mm. these three words if you are talking about the axis so i was thinking whether because there are three different axis you said you could say there is the epistemological the what is the first word could be the the ethical and the behavioral so right something like that so maybe the ignorance could correlate with the epistemological aspect of soul as chit hmm? and the uh, ethical aspect could correlate with the aspect of the the goodness as the ethical aspect co- could correlate with soul and the behavioral aspect could correlate with the with rajas so now of course this is at one level uh, you could say a speculation but <laughs> but i'm just trying to see that when you it just for me it, it opened a new horizon that these three are three different axes and when prabhupada is using three different axes i was thinking what could be the what could be the reason for that maybe this could be i see to explore I, i see what you're saying okay yeah interesting okay yeah i can see that um i i i think that uh, th- that you're providing an interesting analytical model um there there's so much in our um uh, vaishnava uh, philosophy that works with threes mm, that's a good point threes we like threes and in fact in the bhakti sutra it says tri satyasya bhakti eva gariyasi bhakti eva gariyasi and so tri satyasya three truths the threefold nature of truth or the way humans grasp reality uh the offering of the heart um to the beloved in bhakti is uh more than anything else so very precious so the gunas are one thing you know and that's one threefold manifestation of the threefold nature of truth but there are many threefold nature the three is is a, is a kind of again let's use that word transposable you know um you know there's there's uh satchit ananda that's another you know uh trisatya you know there's um uh chit shakti maya shakti uh and and ajiva shakti you know um um there's um a brahman parmatman bhagavan okay so there's you know, we there are endless numbers of threes and there's something about three you know is susti siti pralaya creation maintenance destruction that's brahma vishnu mahesh that's right that's right i mean what what can go on and on yeah okay three planets exactly what yeah. can go on and on and on and on you know yeah, but the idea is that it's it has there's something about three uh that is um that 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 in you know it, it's interesting because in the west we're very binary you know we like two you know you know it you know <laughs> black and white okay but but in india really i think i think three is absolutely necessary you know three is like the bottom line not two you know of course let's first it says of all count sorry yeah. sorry even in yeah. sanskrit there are three yeah. genders not two <laughs> that's right yeah that's right exactly exactly 
And then, and in uh, uh, Bhakti, Krishna Bhakti theology, we've got Radha and Krishna, but we've got Chaitanya. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. So, and, and even if we don't say Chaitanya, we've got Radha and Krishna, and we've got the Ananga, Ananga, the love exchanged between the two of them. Mm -hmm. So there's always three. In one sense, bhakti itself is a three, isn't it? There's bhakta, bhagwan, and bhakti. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. So, so three is there. And, and then, of course, we have the gunas. You know, we've got the, the you know, sattva, rajas, and, and, and tamas. And, and the way these, these um, impact the nature, uh, uh, human nature, is really quite interesting. I mean, these are the tools that the Gita offers its, its reader, its readers, to developing the faculty of discernment, to be able to observe sattva taking place, you know, sattvika kinds of manifestations, or rajasa manifestations, or tamasa manifestations. So, so it, it, the whole idea of being able to know the gunas, be able to observe the gunas, and then be able to transcend the gunas by the gunas. You transcend the gunas by the gunas. Wow. We will come to this. Bro. This is an amazing point. <laughs> before, before this, you made this point that, so this is a tool provided by Krishna to equip or to help us develop our faculty of discernment. Mm. So we can yes. pursue things. So for example, in the, the Upanishads say that go from darkness to light. So one tool for going from darkness yes. to light would be this, this frame. What would we call this framework? You use the word tool. Is it, It's this framework of the three modes. So now yes. uh, that, that raises a fundamental question. Is this a conceptual tool for understanding reality or is it the nature of reality itself? Means, are the modes like a conceptual tool or I hope I'm making myself clear. Like there may be, there are many conceptual tools that say modern psychology might come up. So is it, so for example, there's yin and yang. And there are like that, there are many concepts are there. Now, which whether traditionally or modern times, We've evolved some concepts to analyze reality. So as a conceptual yes. tool itself, it's very valuable. And there could be many conceptual tools. So like we have, uh, I, I mean, I don't, we, ha we have, for example, what should I think? we have uh, nine types of personality, seven types of intelligences or different numbers of personalities people have. So that's a, it's a concept. Now, of course, there is some correlation with reality. We have these kind of people. But is this a conceptual tool to analyze reality or is it, a, is it the very nature of reality? Yes. Both? Both. Okay. <laughs> yeah, <say>? Exactly. <laughs> it's both. And that's, and that's what's, see, that's what's beautiful about it, Chaitanya and Charanji. It's a concept that's aligned so beautifully with the nature of reality. You know, it's, it's, it's um, uh, uh, for example, you can get fresh fruit, and this would be sattvika. Then you can get fruit that's a little old and not so fresh, and that would be rajasa. And then, of course, you can get rotten fruit, which would be tamasa. Okay. So, I mean, there, there's an obvious, you know, uh, mm. tamasa. You know, you know what I like to use? And this is what I use in my teaching. Silver. Things that are silvery are very nice, aren't they? Silvery, you know? Like, say, this ring. You know, mm. it's a silver, silver-colored ring, right? Okay, now, there, there's the tin. There's the metal tin. There's the metal silver. And there's the metal platinum. Tin corrodes. It's shiny silver, but it corrodes. It detracts. 
this Thomasa, the dominant feature of Thomasa is corrosion. It's, it's destruction. Silver is still better because it doesn't corrode, but it tarnishes. It tarnishes. So it's silvery, but it can get darkened. But platinum stays silver. It's pure silver colored. It never tarnishes, nor does it ever corrode. And that's why you pay $1,000 for platinum, but you would never pay more than $5 for a tin ring. <laughs> you know? So, you know, again, this is the quality of life that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. The quality of life. These gunas, everyone talks about the quality of life. The quality of life that lifts me up and makes me happy, this is sattvaka. The quality of life that drains me, that makes me lethargic, this is tamasa. And the mixture of the two is rajas. Hmm. Yeah, this is a fascinating correlation if you're going to the quality in terms yeah. of gunas and the quality of life of people. Actually, you can say that yeah. we may have various parameters today, like we may have the income or and the, we want to improve the, the standard of living of people. But that often differs, it refers only to external, external parameters. They're important. People should have proper food, clothing, shelter. But beyond that, just it's not that everybody who has food, clothing, shelter are happy. Uh, so, That's so, right. So, so we could use the modes to understand the quality of life of a person a far more, uh, you could say, far more realistically than, than only yes. the parameters. Beautiful. Hmm. And maybe that is, also right. the, that is also one of the reasons why. Yes, you know. Yeah, please go ahead. Well, no, I, I was just simply going to say that, that you know, um, I had a friend who called me up one day and said, uh, he said, Garuda, I know what my problem is. I said, what, what is your problem? He said, it's one word. I said, oh, okay, good. What's the one word? He said, it begins with M and ends with Y. Money. I said, how, what do you mean? He said, if I had much more money, I would not have a problem. I would not have, the quality of life would be better. And I said, no. I said, no. Your problem is not that you don't have enough money. The problem is your relationship to money. Your relationship to money is rajasa or tamasa. It drains. You don't know how to maintain the energy. It doesn't matter if you've got a million dollars or one dollar. Your relationship to that money is always destruction. Beautiful. It's no, the was, relationship. Yeah. I was talking with this Hindu, the devotee, who is like an adv advisor on finances for people. So he was telling me that for most people, their financial problems come not because they lack money, but because they lack lack either the knowledge or even the self-discipline to manage money well. So they have an unhealthy relationship with money. Yeah. That's it. Hmm. It's, it. it's about the energy. See, money is simply one part of, of one's life energy. Where do we place our energy and how do we place it? So in the, you you uh, referred earlier in our discussion to the 17th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, um, um, as well as the 14th and 18th, uh, as being really the main uh, places where the gunas are spoken of. Now, you know, in the 17th chapter, it talks about, you know, um, the gunas as far as giving, giving, you know, as in gifts. Now, in one sense, whenever we're interacting with someone, we're giving. When, when I'm, I'm interacting with you right now, Chaitanya Charanji, so I'm giving something to you. You're giving to me. 
and there's a reciprocation. And dialogue is very much a kind of reciprocal giving of shravanam kirtanam, right? Now, if in a dialogue such as ours or any dialogue that seems to be pretty balanced, it starts moving into a kind of negative area where it begins uh, to be draining, then this is, you know, a dialogue that's going, that's going bad. It's going <laughs> into Thomas or regions, right? But if it's a dialogue that is uplifting, that is enlightening, that is bodhyanta parasparam, you know, then this is uplifting. So, so it's about the energy that we give and that we receive. Are we, where are we investing our energy? Now, part of that could be money. Where are we putting the money? Am I, am I uh, spending too much money on, say, uh, uh, board games? I mean, honestly, I don't know how to, I don't even know what board games there are out there, but, but whatever. Let's just say I'm, I'm just collecting a bunch of board games. I mean, what, where, how is that going to lift me up in this life? How is that going to lift me up? Um, you see lots of books behind me. Okay, well, okay, so I'm a scholar and I, you know, I work with books and, and knowledge and I teach and so on. But if I get books that are trashy novels, what does that do to my consciousness? Well, how is that going to be a good form of nourishment or energy that I take in? The energy I take in we have to be sensitive to. Is it sattvaka? Is it lifting me up? Is it tamasa? Is it draining me, uh, a detracting from life, life nourishing, or is it a combination of the two? Beautifully put. So I was recently talking with one devotee about the internet and social media. I was telling this is all tamasic. I, I said, no, you know, you cannot call all of the internet as tamasic. He said, right. you can use it in Krishna's service. But it's not just Krishna's service. There's so much, apart from Krishna's service also, there's so much knowledge being transmitted. People are doing uh, good work also. There's a lot of bad things happening, of course. There is obscenity. Sure. There is hate speech and so many things like that. But, so it's more of our relationship with the, so how are we relating with it? Yeah, uh, exactly. So somebody somebody I, using I mean, the internet. To, I, I mean, yeah. yeah. Somebody's using the internet. No, I mean, I have a knife. I, 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 I have a knife in the kitchen. I have a knife in the kitchen. Mm. I can go across the street and stab my neighbor. Or I can use the knife to cut up vegetables that will be offered to Krishna. Mm. I mean, look at the range of knife, you know? I mean, a knife can be so destructive. And yet it can be such a useful tool for good and upliftment. It's just a knife. It's our consciousness. That's the issue. It's our psychology. It's where our heart is. You know, it, let's go back to that Gita verse, chapter 17, verse 3. According to the degree of the faith, of the faith of everyone, I'm sorry, according to the degree of sattva, in the faith of everyone. Okay, faith. It's interesting how Krishna brings in the idea of faith and the gunas, because faith, shraddha, means it, when you break the word down morphologically, as you know, it means where one places one's heart. Shraddha. Dha means to place. Shraddha, it means a heart. So where one places one's heart, that is faith. So, you know, I can place my heart in destroying people. I can join a group of militant, you know, uh, um, um, uh, terrorists. And I, that's my, but I have faith in it. You know, I have faith in, in, the, in the sort of doctrine of the, of the terrorists to destroy infidels or whatever, right? Or I can have faith in, in beautiful things, things that uplift human beings. 
So, you know, sattva and shraddha, where one places one's heart, that colors everything we do, where our hearts are. If our hearts are steeped with devotion, steeped in devotion for Radha and Krishna, mm. then only, only good can come of it. Pure goodness, pure happiness, and others will be uplifted. That, that verse, it's, uh, it's after I read your translation of it, before that I had not understood the verse, but that's such a profound verse actually. Satvan Rupa Sarvasya Shraddha Bhavati Bharata. That according yeah. to your existence, that's it. Yeah. Your, uh, your faith will manifest. Yeah. But then it says the next part is also, that's it. also a complete cycle. Shraddha Mayoyam Purusha. Yeah. So it is not just according to that's it. our existence, our faith manifests. Our faith makes us who we are. And Shraddha Mayoyam Purusha, Yoya Shraddha Sayevas. That's it. And also make us who will be in the future. So in one sense, you could say faith That's it. defines our existence itself over there. Mm. Absolutely. Absolutely. It has to do with the heart. Mm. So Prabhu, we reside in the heart. The jiva resides in the heart. The, 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 these, the, this sort of divine presence, the paramatma, resides in the heart. Mm. This is the heart is the glow, is the glow of the soul. And if that glow is darkened, and if it's a dark place, we will never be able to see the divine presence or feel the divine presence there. Um, uh, we will live in a very, very uh, dark and, and painful uh, existence. But if the glow is nurtured in bhakti, in Krishna bhakti, the glow of the heart, the energy of the heart, mm -hmm. then everything is beautiful. You know, I recently, I have to share with you, there are two words in Sanskrit that, that directly mean heart, and you know what they are, hrid and hridaya. Yeah. So why are there two words that are so closely, what is the difference between, between hrid and hridaya? Well, I, I, been studying Sanskrit now for 50 years. Now, I, you know, I've been reading in Sanskrit and I've always taken for granted, well, one's just a shorter term, one's a longer term. But you know what hridaya means? Hridaya means heart flow, the flow of the heart, the energy of the heart, whereas hrid just means strictly heart. So the hridaya, aya means flow, as in pratyaya, ebb and flow. So heart flow, the nature of the flow of my heart toward you, Chaitanya Charanji. Now, I happen to have a lot of affection for you. So my heart easily flows to you, toward you. Okay? That's easy. Now, if I meet some other people, like some colleagues, you know, <laughs> you know maybe, maybe it doesn't flow that easily. Uh, but, but uh, or let me put it this way. Even if it does flow to them, they have blocks, you know, there are blocks. Um, but to a Vaishnava heart such as yours, it flows fully to you and you take it in and, and, then, and then we reciprocate. But not all dialogues are that easy. Heart flow, so, so Chaitanya Charanji. Heart and I'm understanding flow, the energy of the heart. So Rudde, the second meaning is flow of the heart. It's not just the, because in one sense, the heart is not, it doesn't have any meaning as just a op, passive object that stays somewhere. The heart is dynamic. It is flowing. So that's beautiful. Yes. And, and just bringing this back to the, linking to the topic of the modes, if I understand right, you earlier mentioned that this, this framework of the modes is, of the gunas is very transposable. So now we, we are illustrating how this yes. could apply in, in relationships. That, you know, whether the flow is yes. nicely or not, that to some extent will depend on the gunas. So whether two hearts are going to connect, yes. at what level they're going to connect. And that will depend on the gunas. Yes, that's true. So yes. now if you, continuing this, 
this metaphor of uh, this this particular analysis about flow in our relationships and the flow of interactions and relationships so again now uh, like we say that we could use i could listen to you and i could respond to you thoughtfully or i could listen just to refute you refute you or i could without listening just uh, s- interrupt you and speak my own thing now in one sense yeah. these three are the choices that people will have irrespective of whether they know about the modes or not so right. in one sense that's right oh uh, wh- th- that humans can behave in different ways that is that is just the nature of human beings we all have free will so in one sense what does yes. what does the analytical frame what is the tool of the modes add is it just uh, giving us a nomenclature to the p- possible pathways of functioning for us or is it something more than that also yes no it's it, it's beautiful i mean look let's let's take um let's Let's take the three types of bhaktas, right? Kanishta bhakta, madhyama bhakta, mm. and uttama bhakta. Mm. Now, as a kanishta bhakta, I'm sort of narrowly focused, you know. And you know what? As a kanishta bhakta, that's healthy. As a little child, is focused only on his or her parents, only in his or her home. Beautiful. This child does not know about other homes. This child just okay. So it's very narrowly focused. So that's natural. This is where, of course, you know, Thomas Aguna is not hierarchical but developmental. What is the difference? Okay, hierarchical and developmental. Hierarchical. Yes. So hierarchically, <laughs> um, w- the one is better than the other. Right. Okay, yeah. Sattva is better than Rajas. Oh, Rajas okay. is better than Tamas. But looking at it more horizontally, for example, my when I'm I'm sleeping at night, that would be Tamas Saguna. I'm unaware of anything around me. When I'm awake during the day and I'm active, that's Rajas Saguna. When I'm sitting in a more contemplative more meditational uh, devotional a, a place you know solely that is more sattvic so that's mm. horizontal so kanishta bhakta narrowly narrow minded madhyama bhakta open minded uh, uh uttama bhakta uttama bhagavata that is broad minded you can have a kanishta bhakta who can be very closed minded open minded or broad minded you can have a madhyama you see now we're doing it hierarchically okay so you can you can do a kind of you know you know axis and, and a kind of horizontal axis and a vertical axis and how they intersect so i could be a madhyama bhakta but be closed minded in other words i'm not a very good madhyama bhakta okay um okay. i'm a better one when i'm more open minded and i'm even a better one so so what is so and a, a kanishta bhakta takes uh one thing that prabhupada says and thinks it's the whole story you know it's the whole story okay that's that's called thomas and guna that's just not correct a, a madhyama bhakta takes one statement that prabhupad makes and looks at the other statements that prabhupad makes okay mm. if as a madhyama bhakta i'm only looking at one or two or three and i don't do a complete job of it that's that's then a tamasa guna madhyama the uh, rajasaguna madhyama would be someone who looks at much more of of what prabhupad says and applying great intelligence would be uh, a, a you know a kind of um a sattvika uh, guna 
uh, uh, sort of uh, application of Madhima. Mm. And then, of course, Uttama Bhaktas are even range in different ways. So anyway, th- so, you know, they're, they're, you, can, you can make a horizontal axis and a vertical axis and see how they intersect. Oh, this is amazing. So horizontal axis and vertical axis. So if I understand right, what you are saying is that at one level, there could be a, there is a basic level of functioning of people. But with respect, right. so somebody might be overall being sattva, but or in rajas. Yes. But with respect to particular things, they may behave tamasically. Like a person may be overall in madhyam, yes. but with respect to one particular aspect of Prabhupada's teachings, they may just obsess on one statement and make it everything. So their approach, <laughs> We won't That's say that right. they are they are in tamaguna, but their approach to that particular aspect is tamasic somewhat. So that's right. It, it, this, this is quite nuanced in one sense, and uh, so I like I was once invited to speak to a gathering of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I grew up in India, where the maybe I don't know the stereotype India also, but I grew up in a place where our conception of my conception of alcoholics was people who drink. And they fall on the streets and maybe they're lying on the ground unconscious. That's what I used to think of as drunkards. But then when I came to the yeah. gathering and I, you know, all the people were very well educated, some of them in big positions in society. And I realized they, they were quite refined in their behavior. So then it struck me mm-hmm. that actually you, I cannot, just because they're alcoholics, I cannot call them in Tamoguna. Because they were holding responsible posts, they were cultured in their behavior. Yeah. But with respect to that one particular aspect, their behavior was, we could say that that habit was tamasic. Maybe that was enveloping right. their life, consuming right. their life, but still. So if I understand right, yes. the vertical axis is with respect to their overall state of existence. And the horizontal axis refers yeah. to their specific activities, how they're acting with respect to right. particular areas. Is that right? What you're trying to say with respect yeah. to the axis? Yes, that's right. No, you've got it. That's right. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, yeah, one is one is seen as uh, gradations of what is better, and another is seen as natural development and natural activities. So, you know, again, one has to define these things. One has to define these things, how you're using them. But the main thing is this, Chaitanya Charanji. These are tools. These are tools to understand the nature of things, the nature of things. Is it closer to, you know, the fulfillment of this life or is it closer to destroying what would have been the fulfillment of this life? And that's what we have to do. You know, finally, Krishna says in 1863, chapter 18, verse 63, now that you've heard all of this, Now that you've heard the great secret and the previous secret, Mm -hmm. now you can choose to do do as you so choose. You don't have free will if you're totally subject to the gunas in the way they um, uh, uh, would naturally sort of um, influence one. So, uh, for example, I can um, uh, I, I can uh, uh, subject myself to to different areas of of influence, and if I am weak, I will be influenced by them. If I am strong, my higher strengths will influence them, or at least protect myself from them. So, if I go into a bar. Okay, so look, I was I was uh, given a a business class ticket last time I went to India. I have never flown business class in my whole life. Okay, you have to pay thousands of dollars to go from, you know, Dallas Airport to to uh, Mumbai on a business class ticket. Okay, now so someone gave this to me. Well. I didn't know what to do with myself in business class. And I was, frankly, I felt terribly isolated in this little cubby. I didn't really like it. I actually prefer coach more. And so 
I felt like, you know, this is a 14 hour flight to Dubai. I said, I feel like interacting with people. So there's a bar in the back of the plane. This is on the second floor of the plane. There are two floors, right? And I, I decided, so this is the first time in my life I ever hung out in a bar. <laughs> and now, you know, <laughs> first time. And I was, of course, you know, kind of um, uh, sort of, uh, how do you say, um, having fun observing this, you know, like this is the first time I'm, I'm going to a bar. Anyway, I arrived there and I'm the only one there at this point. It's fairly early on in the flight. And the uh, bartender says, what would you like to drink? And I said, well, I honestly, I don't, I don't drink alcohol. You know, uh, do you have any like fruit juice? He said, oh, well, we'll give you a mocktail. Well, I didn't know what a mocktail was, but it sounded like it was mocking a cocktail. Anyway, so apparently there really is something called a mocktail. <laughs> so I didn't know this because I'm a little ignorant of these things. So I said, you mean a mocktail is like the, the cocktail without the, 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 the poison, without the, the alcohol in it? He said, yeah. He said, it's just like a fruit drink. I said, well, sure. I'll take a mocktail, you know? So anyway, so... So staying there, you know, I if people would come to the bar, they would start, of course, getting cocktails, not mocktails. And, you know, I would be interacting with them. And, you know, you could just see the, the gunas at work. You just see the gunas at work. It was amazing, you know. Now, did I, at the end of the flight, was I drunk? No, I was not drunk. <laughs> you know, I was observant. Um, it's not that I would choose to go to a bar, but, you know, that was the only thing available there for 14 hours. So, um, and, and, uh, uh, and it was late at night also. So it's not like I could study or use the computer much uh, effectively. But the main point is this, the energy, the energy that is lower than our energy coming to us and influencing us and bringing us down? Or do we take that lower energy with, from someone else and can we lift it up? And that's the latter is what we're about. As Bhaktas, we're here to lift people up. Beautiful. And this is the power of Bhakti. This is the power of Krishna Bhakti. This was the power of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu going out into the city. Come on, we all know what cities are made of. Just all kinds of crazy junk. He would go and interrupt it with the holy names. This is called lifting up everyone out of the gunas. Do we as bhaktas have the power to lift people up out of the gunas? only to the extent that we ourselves are lifted up from the gunas. Mm. Only to the extent that we have transcended the gunas. And the Gita asks us to transcend the gunas. That's beautiful, Ru. Yeah, again, you made so many points. About the bar, that's an amazing example. Mocktail. <laughs> <Nice one. laughs> By the way... <laughs> Yeah, by the way, I was reading some, looking through some books on popular philosophy. So there was a book called Plato in a Bar. So I was going to take it back. So it seems that in, in popular parlance, it's like people don't just go to a bar to just get drunk. They go to a bar to socialize. And often they put their guards down and just open up. So the idea of the theme of the book Plato in a Bar was that that you know, you're like open discussions on philosophy. So again, it's again so nuanced that that a bar normally would consider as a place of tamaguna, but it may not always be a yeah. place of tamaguna only. Of course, I'm not saying that we go yes. there and we try to make it tamaguna, but sometimes uh, when people's inhibitions are lowered, they may actually be more open, more receptive. Of course, it become it's one thing to lower one's inhibitions, and another thing to like lower one's intelligence itself, lower one's consciousness completely. <laughs> that's right. That's, that's yeah. right. That's right. Yeah, but the they're often good. You're the same in a bar. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. So, yeah. but this example of bar is very 
in one sense very graphic because in one sense the whole material world is a place of intoxication you no know? so we are all like, right. we, when we engage in the world so right. we are going into a place of intoxication so are we getting intoxicated or are we helping people become sober so yeah. it's, it's a yeah. beautiful analysis now you made some a point about fear yeah. so now ah uh, yes me, because that's a i think that's a huge philosophical subject but maybe at least we'll touch it briefly so yes at one level the modes are analytical tool for us to understand uh, reality but then they are also yes. constituted of reality and to some extent if i understand right the modes are also like ropes they control us to some extent so so if i understand it uh, let me articulate it in particular say right it's like i i try to write articles on the gita regularly so one article i wrote about the modes is that we are forced to choose we are forced to act as we choose to desire we are forced to act as we choose to desire that means the way we start desiring regularly eventually the, nobody is born say with alcohol bottle in their hands uh but they choose to drink maybe it is a conscious choice maybe it's just their friend their family whatever but as they keep as they choose to desire eventually the mode starts getting greater and greater control and then one particular mode starts becoming like the default mode of functioning so we all have free will but based on how we have desired and how we have acted based on our desires we could say the mode gains more and more control over a person so the free will is never lost but based on our past behavior uh the scope of the free will that we have can be significantly either increased or re- decreased so even an alcoholic mm-hmm. they may have no we may say they have no practically means i have no free will to not drink i have to drink but even they can choose am i going to drink uh, maybe a beer or a whiskey am i going to drink this or that am i going to drink five glasses or six glasses so in one sense the free will is restricted but it's not completely lost because of the modes isn't it i think i agree with you mostly but i think there's a point where and the gita seems to paint this picture where one is helplessly tossed about by the gunas you know uh um, there's a sense in which you know i had a colleague come up to me once who's very fond of reading the gita and he read my translation carefully but not carefully enough because he said uh he said dr schwag i think i get it basically we are completely fated according to the gunas we have no free will i said that's your reading of the gita he said yeah there's no it's completely deterministic by the most we're simply puppets being pulled by the strings of the gunas i said that can be the condition of the of the self but the self can rise and go above the uh the the, the sort of uh, the puppeteer of the gunas you know we don't have to be thrown around by the puppeteer Uh, rather we can actually make the puppeteer <laughs> you know <laughs> do things now now when you get to a level of darkness chitana charanji and you mentioned addiction addiction is famous for where we act we we just we don't have a choice i mean free will is gone when i let me put it this way if i get drunk and i've seen drunk people you know they are blithering idiots they are not over they have no control over their limbs what to speak of a steering wheel they are literally out of control they're drugged they have they and 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 you know what and they ask for more drink in that condition any addictions when we if we take the word seriously addiction probupad speaks in the purport the purport prior to the purport in which he speaks about 
women like men who are expert at rape. Most devotees are trying to like absorb that and say, yeah, 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 all men are rapists, all women uh, want to be raped. I mean, this is ridiculous. Prabhupada in the prior purport speaks about sex addictions. When one has an addiction, if I have an addiction, um, uh, uh, let's say a gambling addiction, if I have a gambling addiction, I'm going to befriend you, Chaitanya Jaranji. I'll, I'll seem very nice, but eventually I'm going to ask you for money. I will use you for my addiction because I am desperate to fulfill the, I, I am without control except to serve and to be enslaved by that addiction, whether it be gambling, whether it be sex, whether it be intoxicants. You know, Prabhupada warned us in the regulative principles that these are addictions, and even eating meat is a kind of an addiction. I've talked to people who cannot give up meat. They cannot give it up. As cruel, as cruel and as horrible it is to eat meat, and, and, and as horrible the effects of eating meat are on the whole planet, they cannot give it up. They cannot. This is because they are so tied to their, they're weak. They're weak. And how are they weak? They're weakened by this Thomas Aguna. It's just, they're, they're not, uh, they haven't activated that, that strength of will. So it's not a question of choosing desires. It's a question of the desires. Desires are epiphenomenal of our conditioning. Epiphenomenal means they naturally that emerge. They are just a consequence, like yeah, a, it, a natural consequence, you could say. That, that's it. That's it. So, so it, it's, it's, it's when, now, okay, so let's take Arjuna. Okay? Arjuna. Wow. Did, does Arjuna seem to be able to choose his desires in the first chapter? <laughs> he, he fell into a very serious slump. I mean, in clinical terms, he was severely depressed. Mm. He, was not, he was dysfunctional. He was non-functional. Right? He, he dropped his bow. He, sat, he collapsed. Chaitanya Charanji, he collapsed in his chariot. He's about to go to war and he collapses in his chariot. This is like if I were, would go to the Smithsonian to give a lecture, which I often do, and like right before it, I, I mean, I just, I, I, I can't do it. I can't, I, I can't, I can't, you know, I can't face the, the audience, you know. I mean, for weeks they've been programming it, months actually, They've been programmed, people signed up, people are there, people are ready to, to go, you know, and I, 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 I freak out and I, I slump, I go into a slump. What kind, of, what kind of willpower do I have? Something else is draining me, is bringing me down, that's beyond my control. And that's why a teacher, that's why the guru, that's why the counselor, Krishna is the best counselor you can ever, best psychoanalyst, you know, psychiatrist you could ever have. So Arjuna had it pretty good, you know. But we need someone else to lift us up out of this. I mean, look at the first verse of the Guruvashtakam, samsara dava nalalida loka, right? The world is, is lit on fire. It's a fire that is out of control and only by the, the grace you know, of, of, of Guru who takes from the ocean of grace, Kripa Sindhu, takes it up by evaporation and the cloud and then moves over the land and pours rain down on that forest fire that's out of control. Will that fire be able to be put out? This is the power of Guru and Krishna. 
It's the only thing, it's the only way out. One could be even stuck in sat, sattvaka, uh, sattva guna. Hey, life is good, you know, I mean, like, you know, I'm doing well, everything's good, nothing, no real problems. But you haven't conquered birth and death. You haven't risen above the gunas. The Prabhupada, I mean, the Gita says, um, become free from birth, death, old age, and, and, and suffering. You know, become immortal. These are things beyond the gunas, you know. Um, one despises nor desires when one is gone, one has gone beyond the, the gunas. <coughs> But one remains the same in suffering and happiness and attains a happiness which is categorically different than the happiness one derives uh, from the gunas. One derives imperishable happiness. Akshaya sukham, right? Anyway. So you're saying that we derive happiness beyond the gunas or from the gunas? Or we use the gunas to go beyond the gunas. <laughs> well, we do use the gunas to go beyond the gunas. I mean, um, the uh, the the um, the Yoga Sutra mm. says everything in this world, whether manifest or subtle, is a combination of the gunas and embodiments of the self or the Atman. Now it says that. Um, uh, let me see here. Uh, I've got. Uh, I thought I got some. Once one has reached this knowledge of the divine, the purpose of the gunas in all their transformations, at their various stages, has been entirely fulfilled in their role as the three quality of life forces of the phenomenal world. So the idea is that you know. Knowledge of the divine allows one to see the gunas at work. One can see the gunas at work. And the gunas know, in a way, it's almost like the energy of the gunas are reversed. And that's what the last sutra text in the Yoga Sutra says. The truly liberated person, Purusha. Yeah. No, no, I'm just thinking what it, you said. There's so many things. It's, it, it's almost like yeah, uh, sure. the, yeah. the gunas are like a magic. And once you know the magic trick, then the magic trick can't fool you. But as long as, <laughs> magic, right. exactly. as, long as you don't know how the magic trick is working, you're completely fooled. So that's what if you're saying, that you're saying that knowledge of the divine helps us to see the modes at work. work. Actually, if you could become yes. aware, hey, this is, the, this is Rajas taking me over. When a conversation is yes. raising our voice or something like that, so I just think if we could become aware, then it would be much easier at least to try to resist. But absolutely, yeah. So now you're the actually to just, become aware. Yeah, to become aware is actually power. That awareness is an energy that will counteract the influence of the gunas, and then in effect one reverses the flow. It, the, the truly liberated person, Purusha, is one whose purposes are utterly devoid of the quality of life forces, the gunas. Their flow to the self now reversed. So the gunas are no longer coming to you, but they're flowing away from you, and you are at a transcendent level. It's a reversal of the flow of the gunas. It's as if the strings that used to pull you as, as a puppet of the gunas, it's as if those strings became rods and now you're controlling the puppeteer. You're controlling the puppeteer. Amazing. So it's, uh, you know, I think in... The magician, opinion, as you yeah. said. Yeah. So it's like, uh, say, if I'm in the ocean, then I'm subject to the waves. 
but it's almost like if you are right. above the ocean, if say we are lifted up, air lifted or something like that, then we will not be affected by the by the waves. But you are saying it can go even further. Yes. Rather, not only being not affected by the waves, in a sense, we could affect the waves. We could affect the waves. No, yes. We can't affect the waves in the ocean, but in in this particular sense, yeah, like. Uh, we can say that if a very advanced devotee comes to a particular place, like you said, they bring their energy and they lift up the uh, lift up the environment just by their presence. That's so, right. That's beautiful. And they they themselves create the tirthas, as the Bhakti Sutra says. Wherever such a liberated person goes, they are creating the tirthas, just as Mahaprabhu Garanga did when he went to Vrindavan and excavated Radhakund and Shamakund. Hmm. You take this world, you take this world, and you trans, you sort of, if, if Prakriti is a Parinama, right, is a Parinama, Brahman, uh, Brahma Parinama, well, then you transform it back. Bhakti is that transformation, that that sort of retro transformation. Retro transformation, okay. So in one sense, it's almost like a, our present present uh, functioning is almost like a distortion. So it's a retro in the sense we are going back to where we were originally. Is that what you're trying to say? So it's a reversion yes. to our original nature. That's right. Hmm. That's right. But but yet it's 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 not just a a um, how would you say a total dismissal of of the of the prakriti in which one found oneself in which the, the which embroiled one and and and, and the bondage of, of conditioned existence but rather it's a creative process it's taking prakriti which is designed to cover and conditioned to take prakriti to uh, 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 become formed to shape transcendence. Mm -hmm. Take prakriti to reflect that from which it originally came. That from which it originally came. Hmm. That's why in the Bhagavad Gita, that verse is there, 424. I, Brahmar, Brahma, Havir. Like everything is Brahman. It's yeah. Here. And Prabhupada that's also it. That purport, purport says that everything is Brahman. It's only Brahman covered by illusion is Maya. That's what you also said. That's so, it. Mm. That's it. So, Prabhupada is famous for tapping on the microphone, right? Yeah. I, I have seen him do that. I have seen him do that. He'll tap. He said, this is spiritual. Tap, tap, tap. This is spiritual. Now, when you look at it, it's a regular microphone. You know, it's got the little wire mesh on the front. It's got the, the metal part going back, and it's being held up by a stand. It's a mundane microphone. Prabhupada, tap, tap, tap. This is spiritual. It's a reversion. It's a reverting back to the original state by using it in the service of Brahman, it becomes Brahman, even in its temporary prakritic uh, form. Beautiful. So bhaktas are transformers. <laughs> bhaktas are transformers. Mm, yeah, that's right. And the gunas, the gunas, then are only useful. They're not using us. They're useful to us. Hmm. They're useful to us. Yeah. And that's the that's the state which we would all like to be in. So in one <laughs> sense, right. yeah. Exactly. So now maybe I'll conclude with one important question. One question. We don't want to go to Yes. So, is it that you quoted the verse from the from the Bhakti Sutra where knowledge of the divine helps us to see the modes? So, 
is it helpful to systematically analytically understand the modes or is it just we should we just practice bhakti and automatically an understanding of the modes will come for us and we will be able to distance ourselves from it or it's both um it is both but um i mean as you well know chitanya charanji as a as a as a very devoted and realized student of the bhagavad gita that krishna this is a subject that's woven in and, and throughout the whole gita uh in some areas far more than other areas but the gunas really are something that krishna wants us to know they really are he wouldn't have gone into it as much in fact he doesn't seem to go into anything else quite the same way that he does the gunas you know he'll start a subject he'll start something he'll take it and and show the process um and then finish it and then show how all of this can be used ultimately to realize him okay but the gunas they keep coming up here and there you know and then sometimes a lot and and it's 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 the gunas are treated by krishna as something that really should be realized because to realize the gunas is in some sense to transcend them you cannot transcend that which you are unaware that of which you are unaware it cannot be transcended if you're aware of them you can transcend them the first step in transcending the gunas That's so this is one of the great gifts of the gita one of the really powerful gifts of the gita is to understand the nature of the gunas how they work within various contexts um you know whether it's the the, uh, the context of uh you know of of uh, uh you know uh, sacrificial worship or whether it's the context of austerities whether it's the context of faith context of food sacrificial offerings personal traits and gifts all of that is in the 17th chapter mm. to transcend the gunas is a place where you utter om tat sat oh that's the conclusion of the chapter okay. that's why that that's how it ends that's right om tat sat the otherness the infinite otherness is tat the infinite non otherness is sat and the omkar is that constant seeking and searching and absorption in both tat and sat <laughs> yeah this is the beginning of a new podcast <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's amazing maybe indeed indeed chat right. infinite yeah. otherness infinite non otherness yeah, what does that mean yes oh yes yeah. oh yes these are these are these are terms that i've come up with and for good reason but we'll discuss some other time yeah okay yeah we we'll love to discuss this because in one otherness sense, and, and, and non otherness Yeah, this Om Tat Sat is such a common, uh, common term in the broad Vedic context. But what it signifies would be a fascinating discussion. Oh, oh, it's the essence of of theology. Om in those three simple utterances is is the essence of all true theology. Amazing yeah, that you are making it like an irresistible. promo a trailer for the next podcast now <laughs> this true so so if i just understood the answer uh, so we'll leave that for the next podcast but if i understood the answer what you are saying is that at one level bhakti itself can help us transcend the modes but it's oh, if we don't yes. know 
then it's it's more difficult to transcend so if somebody has that spontaneous yes. devotion then even without knowing they can transcend but for most of us uh, transcending will take some time so this this is also a tool a resource that krishna has given and as i said as i said pervades the gita yes so if krishna has given a tool and yes. it, he has emphasized it so much it also becomes our our duty to understand the tool and use that tool ultimately for practicing bhakti more effectively for connecting with krishna for serving krishna mm. yes yes sir yes in bhakti shraddha where we place our hearts is in something so exquisite so beautiful so uh lovable that there's no question of the gunas playing a part in that in shuddha bhakti or in bhakti itself yes in in shuddha in in bhakti yeah bhakti mm. so it it's a matter of 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 the heart a transformation of the heart and but but it uh, again in vaidhi bhakti in vaidhi bhakti we should be aware of learning uh, about the life of bhakti of the activities of bhakti um yes um we should take advantage of these valuable tools so we can understand our own natures um self realization doesn't mean realization just of the pure self but it means understanding the nature of our conditioned selves so we can understand how to transcend that and address those things become purified of those things self realization means both the conditioned self and the and the pure self otherwise you know mm-hmm. i mean chaitanya charanji how is it that such advanced vaishnavas can find trouble at such advanced stages how they can falter and this is nicely explained uh in both uh, bhakti philosophy and yoga philosophy yoga philosophy talks about samadhi is the highest stage but sabija samadhi with seeds those seeds if they get nourished and watered those seeds of conditioning while one is at samadhi one can be growing a plant you know a botanical right out of samadhi that is very powerful the seeds of conditioning very very powerful and if they are ignored then at a later time they can pop up in a very inopportune moment and take over one's whole life of bhakti one can falter badly even badly but that again is another subject for another <laughs> <laughs> yeah so so that's another, is, another is, subject for you to try and try any more to say actually so but what you are trying to say if i understand right is that basically the modes are a tool which help us observe and we always need to be observant because if if you are not if you not we may think that we are advanced yes. devotees but if you are not then this these bijas are still there within us and the bijas may, right. may manifest and if we That's have right. the tool of mani- the modes then that may we may that may help us detect it relatively early and then we can check it yes that's right exactly the self realization exactly. has both meanings and that also so how the modes are affecting me how my current nature is that is also important to understand that's right that's a beautiful understanding absolutely so you may say that i am not my body yeah but at the same time i have to understand the body that i have i just can't i'm not the body so i don't yes. neglect the body and that's why krishna talks that's about right. swabhava, swabhava quite often in the gita Arjuna, this is your sabhava. This is your nature. That's right. Act accordingly. Yeah. That's right. True. So, so, so yeah. Socrates, Beautiful. Yeah. So, Socrates, know thyself. This, all those things, you know, body, mind, and soul. We can say, no, all of it. That's it. Yeah. Beautiful. That then that then we are realized. Yes. This is such a holistic understanding of self-realization that sometimes yeah. sometimes it becomes like very abstract and theoretical. I, I say I am the soul. but then we are so you could say not put together in our daily life 
because we are not really understood yeah. ourselves at, a, at the the physical and the mental dimensions of our being also yeah yeah beautiful bro should i try to summarize yes please yes so today we discussed about the concept of the modes so i started talking about the modes as uh, ropes and constitutive elements of reality and the new of of material reality so you said that modes are basically we could say something like coverings spirit they are the degrees to which the spirit is covered and you could say sattva is transparent rajas is translucent and uh, tamas is opaque and then we discussed a little bit about terms that you no know, diff- the prabhupada has used goodness passion ignorance the same way they are like in three different uh, axes so goodness refers to more of ethical axis uh, passion can refer more to behavioral functional axis and ignorance refers more to epistemological axis so in one sense that is prabhupada's brilliance that acting in goodness means one will be sensitive in passion one will be one will be like self absorbed and in ignorance one will be destructive so in that sense there is a coherence also then i just made the exploratory point that this yes. correlate with sachit ananda uh, then the important point was right. that when we use the terms depending on uh, context we can see what what how best to convey the concept so you said that you prefer not to translate just skip satvaraja satamas and explain right and philosophical disco- discussion is has this is a very foundational thing what are we talking about so defining terms is very important yeah and then with respect to the gunas we discuss about uh, th- that how th- these gunas they help us perceive reality you know they are their tools for us to in- to enhance our faculty of discernment and then we discuss various examples of how in sattva rajas tamas we will perceive things differently and then the gunas are mm. both mm. a tool and they are also the nature of reality itself they are constitutive of reality and yeah. then uh, the gunas it's almost as if the soul is moving, moving helplessly in prakriti so it's not entirely deterministic but to yeah. to a significant especially when a person gets addicted then there can be addiction to even eating meat or whatever then it's almost like the person is controlled but fortunately we have the capacity to raise our consciousness we are atma and then the atma can so at one level we are within the modes we are controlled by the modes uh, we are tossed about but we have the potential to rise and that's where the guru that's where the spiritual knowledge and ultimately bhakti comes up so the modes yeah are they uh, we did discuss earlier about this uh, three things tin silver and platinum so they are all have the silver color but the degree to which it is enduring so tamas has corrosive effects so silver can be very easily right. contam- uh, it can be tainted but this is like that but eventually sattva is sattva is it's enduring and then we discuss about sattva and shraddha sattva anurupa shraddha mm-hmm. how that was we discussed about how faith uh, is a function of our existence and even faith can be in the three modes so the modes are a tool which is given by krishna and in one sense either we for us the modes can be harmful or they can become helpful if we rise above the modes then we engage with the modes so you talked about the hierarchical and the developmental so developmental means like a child yes. a child naturally grows so in one sense a child newborn baby is ignorant but a child naturally grows and is expected to not just grow biologically but also grow in understanding so like that there is a development through the lower modes to a higher mode and at the same time the, 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 the developed to rajas to sattva but at the same time these are also they are hierarchical one is higher one is lower and it is subtle that a person may be in sattva but a particular activity they may be in, may in tamas a devotee may be relatively madhyama situated but yes. one particular view one particular activity they they, they might be just looking at it only one statement and that could be tamasic that can apply to various things like a yeah. person may be a could say a responsible business executive but they may also be an alcoholic so these modes are subtle in that sense yeah. and uh, so so then towards the end you discussed about uh, a lot of concepts towards the end which say could say for the next <laughs> session 
but the modes so we do have the our free will gets most empowered when we practice bhakti so by the practice of bhakti we get the knowledge to see the modes and that's like a magic trick once we understand it's there then it doesn't affect us but for us as sadhakas we do both we cultivate yes. bhakti and we try to understand the modes because it's also a tool which is given by krishna so rather than seeing the modes as something yes. separate from bhakti we can see our analysis of the modes also as reciprocating with krishna's gift that he has given us then it, we can say it almost becomes a part of bhakti rather than seeing it as something separate from bhakti so then we, the more we are aware the more we can transcend and then we can go to the stage of eventually nirbija samadhi where we say go beyond a beyond a place where a person may relapse again but till then is we have to be cautious and the yeah. modes are a valuable tool for being self aware and cautious because ultimately self realization means yes not just understanding the soul but also understanding my body and mind and how they are prone to be influenced by the modes then i can protect myself so anything you want to add to yeah. me i think you did a beautiful job as usual uh when summarizing i always love to hear you rattle off a total summary of what we've been discussing for a good hour and a half so that's that that, that is a, uh, a a very wonderful quality you've got uh, chaitanya charanji thank you bruce i think the result of your speech there are so many points just uh, i can think that my brain gets lit as we discuss i know <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. I hope I'm not creating a traffic jam. <laughs> thank you very much, Chetan. It's like an ecstatic kirtan rush, you know. <laughs> it's not a traffic jam. It's like yeah. ecstatic kirtan crowding. <laughs> thank yeah. you very much. Very good. <laughs> thank, thank you, so Chetan Tranji. Hare Krishna. Okay.